book of Leviticus. It's the third book of the Bible, and it's set right after the exodus of the Israelites from their slavery, when God brought them to the foot of Mount Sinai and invited Israel into a covenant relationship. Now, they had quickly rebelled and broke that covenant, and God had wanted for his glorious presence to come and live right in the midst of Israel in the form of this tabernacle. But Israel's sin has damaged the relationship. So, at the end of the previous book, Exodus, Moses, as Israel's representative, could not even enter God's presence in the tent. The book of Leviticus opens by reminding us of this fundamental problem. It says, the Lord called to Moses from the tent. So the question is, how can Israel, in their sin and selfishness, be reconciled to this holy God? That's what this book is all about, how God is graciously providing a way for sinful, corrupt people to live in his holy presence. Now, let's pause for a second and explore this really important idea that God is holy. It's fundamental to understanding this book. The word holy means simply to be set apart or unique. And in the Bible, God is set apart from all other things because of his unique role as the creator of all, as the author of life itself. And so if God is holy, then the space around God is also holy. It's full of his goodness and his life and purity and justice. So if Israel, who is unjust and sinful, wants to live in God's holy presence, they too need to become holy. Their sin has to be dealt with. Thus, the book of Leviticus. Now, the book has a really amazing symmetrical design. It explores the three main ways that God helps Israel to live in his presence. The outer sections are descriptions of the rituals Israel was to practice in God's holy presence. The next inner sections focus on the role of Israel's priests as mediators between God and Israel. And inside of that are two matching sections that focus on Israel's purity. And then right here at the center of the book, there's a key ritual, the Day of Atonement, that brings the whole book together. The book concludes with a short section where Moses calls on Israel to be faithful to this covenant. Let's dive into the book. The first section explores the five main types of ritual sacrifices that Israel was to perform. Two of these were ways that an Israelite could say thank you to God by offering back to God the symbolic tokens of what God has first given them. Three other sacrifices were different ways of saying sorry to God. So here an Israelite would offer up the lifeblood of an animal while confessing that their sin has created more evil and death in God's good world. But instead of destroying this person, God, of course, wants to forgive them. And so this animal symbolically dies in their place and atones, which means it covers for their sin. And so through these rituals, the Israelites were constantly being reminded of God's grace, but also of his justice and of the seriousness of their evil and its consequences. The second set of rituals lays out the seven annual feasts of Israel. And each of these retold a different part of the story about how God redeemed them from slavery in Egypt and brought them through the wilderness on their way to the promised land. And by celebrating these feasts regularly, Israel would remember who they were and who God was to them. Now the sections about Israel's priests, you have Aaron and his sons first ordained to enter into God's presence on behalf of Israel. And then in this matching section, we find the qualifications for being a priest. The priests were called to the highest level of moral integrity and ritual holiness because they represented the people before God, but then also represented God to the people. Now, we find out why the priest's holiness matters so much back here in this first section. Right after the family of Aaron was ordained, two of his sons waltz right into God's presence and flagrantly violate the rules. And so they are consumed by God's holiness on the spot. It's a haunting reminder of the paradox of living in God's holy presence. Because it's pure goodness, but it becomes dangerous to those who rebel and insult God's holiness. And so it's important that Israel's priests become holy, and also that all of the people of Israel become holy, which is what the next inner sections are all about. Chapters 11 through 15 are about the ritual purity required of all the Israelites, and chapters 18 through 20 are about the moral purity of the people. Here's what's underneath all of this purity and impurity language. Because God is holy and he's set apart, the Israelites need to be in a state of holiness themselves when they enter into his presence. This was called being clean or pure. God's presence was off limits to anybody who was not in a holy state, and this was called being unclean or impure. Now, an Israelite could become impure in just a few ways. 
by contact with reproductive body fluids, by having a skin disease, by touching mold or fungus, or by touching a dead body. Now, for the Israelites, all of these were associated with mortality, with the loss of life, which gets us to the core symbol of all these ideas. You become impure when you're contaminated by touching death, so to speak. And death is the opposite of God's holiness because God's essence is life. Now, this is really key. Simply being impure was not sinful or wrong. Touching these kinds of things was a normal part of everyday life. And impurity was a temporary state. It just lasted a week or two, and then it's over. What was wrong or sinful was to waltz into God's presence carrying these symbols of death and impurity on my body. Don't do that. Now, the last way of becoming impure was by eating certain animals. And the kosher food laws are found right here in this section. Now, there have been lots of theories about why certain animals were considered impure and off limits to promote hygiene or to avoid cultural taboos. The text just isn't explicit. But the basic point of all of these chapters is really clear. Altogether, these work as an elaborate set of cultural symbols that remind Israel that God's holiness was to affect all areas of their lives. This corresponding section over here is about Israel's moral purity. The Israelites were called to live differently than the Canaanites. They were to care for the poor instead of overlooking them. They were to have a high level of sexual integrity, and they were to promote justice throughout their entire land. Now here at the center of the book, we find a long description of one of Israel's annual feasts, the Day of Atonement. Odds are that not every Israelite's sin and rebellion would be covered through the individual sacrifices. And so once a year, the high priest would take two goats. One of these would become a purification offering and atone for the sins of the people. And the other was called the scapegoat. The priest would confess the sins of Israel and symbolically place them on this goat. And then it would be cast out into the wilderness. Again, this is a very powerful image of God's desire to remove sin and its consequences from his people so that God can live with them in peace. The book concludes with Moses calling Israel to be faithful to all of the terms of the covenant. And he describes the blessings of peace and abundance that will result if Israel obeys all of these laws. He also warns them that if they're unfaithful and dishonor God's holiness, it will result in disaster and ultimately exile from the land promised to Abraham. Now, if you want to see how Leviticus fits into the big storyline, it's helpful to look at the first sentence of the next book of the Bible, Numbers. It begins, the Lord spoke to Moses in the tent. So we can see that Moses is now able to enter God's presence on behalf of Israel. The book of Leviticus, it worked. So despite Israel's failure, God has provided a way for their sin to be covered so that God can live with sinful people in peace. And that's what the book of Leviticus is all about. me. I know what you're thinking. He picked my favorite book. Uh, I know. Um, I didn't post anything about us starting Leviticus just yet because I didn't want too many people here. You know what I'm saying? Um, it's right there with Revelation. When you, when you say you're going to study through Revelation, everybody shows up to church. Uh, you say you're doing Leviticus, everybody leaves church. Um, hey, look, uh, Leviticus is an awesome book. Okay, um, I know there's weird stuff in there. I know there's uncomfortable things in there. Um, but it's a book about holiness. I remember taking a, an online Bible course through Leviticus, and it was all about the holiness of God. And after doing that study, I was like, this book deserves more credit than what it gets. Um, so we are going to go, here's how we're going to do Leviticus. We are going to fly through Leviticus. Okay, we are going to cover several chapters tonight. When I say several, I mean seven chapters tonight, um, and we're, we're going to read through them. I'll make note here and there concerning uh, different things, but we're going to cruise on through Leviticus, and then once that's done, we're going to cruise on through Numbers, and then we're going to cruise on through Deuteronomy, and that'll be the end of the year. Uh, and I look, I want to start the book of Joshua, but here's my dilemma. 
if I start De Joshua, then I'm like, when am I ever going to go back into Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, which Deuteronomy I love is a tremendous book as well. But um, so I'm like, I, we did Exodus and then we did a little break in Hebrews chapter 11 and then we did Esther and Daniel and all that good stuff. So I was like, we need to go back through, finish out the Pentateuch, which is the first five books of the, of the Bible. And uh, yeah, and then we can venture into Joshua, then Judges, we've already done Ruth, and so then we'll jump over into 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, and so forth, right? So we will cover the entire Old Testament, but we're going to do Leviticus chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and yes, 7, okay? So let me pray, and then we're going to get started with this right away. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for the fact that if we don't appreciate your sacrifice after studying through Leviticus, Lord, then we just don't get it. Um, Lord, I thank you so much that you are the once and for all perfect sacrifice for us. And there's not a single one of us that had to show up here tonight with a, an animal in tow. Lord, and we're grateful for that. Thank you for a new covenant. Thank you for your blood that covers a multitude of sins. And I thank you for the forgiveness of that you freely offer to us, both past, present, and future. So we thank you so much, Lord, for you and for who you are, and we pray that you would speak to our hearts tonight as we just go through the book of Leviticus and look at offerings and all that good stuff, Lord. And we just pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, let me ask you a question. When you are growing up, did your, did your family have that special uh, dinnerware? China, maybe, is what you called it. Um, did you guys, did you have that within your house? I think we may have had that in my house. I don't really recall too much. Um, but you understand what I'm talking about. It's that select dish, dishes, that uh, you never get to eat off of, especially if you're a child. You would never even get to touch these things, right? These are set aside for special occasions. And, uh, and, and maybe your family for Thanksgiving or for Christmas would break out the fine china, and then it became a celebration, right? You knew it's a special meal when the best was brought out. Uh, I was doing some studying today, and I came across this article that I wanted to read to you guys concerning that and, and relate this to um, how, how we bring an offering to God, okay? Um, but this uh, Charlotte uh, Lat Latvala, if that's how you say her name, my apologies, Charlotte, um, she wrote this article, and it says, Break Out the Fine China. She says, through a series of family events, I have recently found myself in possession of my late mother's china. That's right, china, the stuff that brides of the 1940s dreamed about, planned for, and collected. The fancy plates of varying sizes, the cups and saucers, the matching sugar bowls, the gravy boats, and the spectacularly large serving trays. This elaborate set of dishes wouldn't be out of place in an episode of Downton Abbey. To my family living on the outskirts of Cleveland, that English bone china was the epitome of high style. It was our Thanksgiving, our Christmas, our meeting potential new spouse's dinnerware. I grew up in fear and awe of it, all because I associated it with exciting occasions along with the good silver and, and deli or delicate glasses, none of which were allowed to, to go into our cumbersome 1970s dishwasher. What, by the way, she says. Fear, because the idea of breaking any of the pieces was unthinkable. Not that my mother was a, a tyrant in any way. She was not a disciplinarian or a screamer. Quite the opposite. I couldn't bear to see the look of pain and disappointment on her face if I happened to chip a cup or saucer while washing it. I also grew up with the idea that China was worth a fortune. It was an inheritance, in the, inheritance of unspeakable wealth. It's not, thanks Google, she notes. Um, but the china is beautiful. It's edged with the delicate motif of wildflowers in soft pinks and yellows and blues. I love it for its pure aesthetic value as well as the memories it holds. But what to do with it? Our world has spiraled into a casualness of an, at an ever-increasing rate. What was formal in the 1940s was quaint in the TV dinner 1970s, and that was 50 years ago. Now we're more like a eat chipotle in the car to sit down to a pot roast uh, at evening uh, at even the most haphazard table. She says, when my husband and I, and when mine and my husband's friends are over, 
not that that happens often, we often point our guests to a stack of paper plates and napkins. I know I'm not alone. People much younger than me are inheriting grandma's china and silver and are, and are at a loss at about what to do with it. I could always sell it, but that would be like selling my mother's soul, and I honestly don't want to part with it. I guess the inevitable solution is to start entertaining on a grand scale. We're empty nesters now. We have more time, if not more money. I'd like to think I have a few dinner parties left in me. So maybe our next cookout will be on fine china instead of paper plates. Maybe we'll start a retro trend, and I'll not, try not to burst into tears if someone cracks a soup bowl. And I, I like that article because it, it reminded me of, really of just Leviticus and our offerings to God. And I think Christianity, just like uh, Charlotte had noted within the, her article, uh, you know, this, this spiraling towards casualness. And I think even Christianity has spiraled, spiraled towards unhealthy casualness concerning the holiness of God. And Leviticus is all about like, being set apart, being different than the world that surrounds you. And it's about bringing offerings because you serve a God who is holy and he is deserving of our absolute best. He deserves the fine china to be brought out. And yet I think so much within our lives, we, we're dishing out the paper plates to God. Here you go, God. Here you go. Just crumble it up and throw it away when you're done with it right? I don't want to do dishes. Here's the plastic fork. Here's the plastic spoon. You know, and I like that article because it, it reminded me of like, just there's this reverence, kind of like with Charlotte and her, her mother's fine china, this, this fear and awe, you know, awe of understanding what it is, what it means, and everything that the significance behind it. But, you know, the fear, and there should be a healthy uh, fear within our lives concerning us and God. And, and so going through Leviticus, I want to break out the fine china. And I want us to break out the fine china when it comes to our relationship with God. I, I, I get when people come and say, you know, God's, you know, well, God's my buddy. He's not your buddy. He's not your buddy. God's my homie. Jesus is my homie. He's not your homie. He's not. He's God. He's God Almighty. He's creator. That's who he is. Is he your friend? Yes, he's your father, he's your Abba, he's your Papa. But we, may we never lose sight of the fact that he is God Almighty, God Almighty. And he deserves the China to be brought out. He deserves the best. Leviticus frames that out for us and what he expects, and not just you know, what he expects, but why he deserves it. So historically, Leviticus is happens immediately after the book of exodus there's no there's no years that pass by there if at best there's maybe a month that passes by from the events where we left off in exodus uh you know and, and they're camped out at the mount sinai region um and they've they've uh, we went through that whole study where they they had the plans for the tabernacle and then they had the plans for a tabernacle and then they built a tabernacle and then the last thing was God's presence descending onto the tabernacle and Exodus ends and Levit Leviticus picks right up from there, okay? So his presence is, is now with his people. It's with his people. Verse one of chapter one says this, and the Lord called to Moses from the tabernacle and said to him, give the following instructions to the people of Israel. When you present an animal as an offering to the Lord, not if, but when, you may take it from your herd of cattle or your flock of sheep or sheep and goat, goats, okay? So you got an option. And, the, and I'll tell you, we're going to cover five offerings tonight. That's why we're going through chapter seven. Um, I believe the first three are optional offerings, and the last two are not optional at all. But here's God saying, all right, listen, when it comes to worshiping me, here's how you're going to worship me. And it is God who defines worship, and it is God who sets the parameters on worship and not us. We do not get to tell God how we will worship him. God alone says, this is how you will worship me. This is what's acceptable, and this is what's not acceptable, okay? Leviticus lets us know that. Now, I, again, I, just like I prayed, I praise the Lord that Jesus fulfilled 
the law, okay? Um, because Leviticus has, we can approach Leviticus as, you know, Christians in a, in a whole different light. Because we're not coming to this thing of like, okay, uh, we're in, okay, so I need to mark down these things for the burnt offering. Okay, so when I go home, I need to burn an animal um, so God's happy with me. You know, we don't have to do that. And I'm so grateful for that. Um, but we can approach it. And, and some people like to throw Leviticus away and say, well, we don't even, even in the Calvary chapels, I've heard of guys saying, well, we don't really need to teach through Leviticus. And I say, that's garbage. I say, that's not smart, guys, because Leviticus applies to us today. And right from the beginning, God's like, here's how you're going to worship me. And Christians today should take note on that, how to worship God. So he's like, I'm going to give you an option. You could take from the herd of your cattle or from the flock of your sheep and your goats. Verse 3, if the animal you present as a burnt offering is from the herd, it must be a male with no defects. Bring it to the entrance of the tabernacle so you may be accepted by the Lord. Lay your hand on the animal's head and the Lord will accept its death in your place to purify you. Okay, It's a substitution for you, making you right with him. Then slaughter the young bull in the, presen- in the Lord's presence, and Aaron's sons, the priests, will present the animal's blood by spattering it against all the sides of the altar that stands at the entrance of the tabernacle. Then, the skin, uh, then skin the animal and cut it into pieces. The sons of Aaron, the priests, will build a wood fire on the altar, and they will arrange the pieces of the offering, including the head and fat, on the wood burning on the altar." But the internal organs and the legs must first be washed with water. Then the priest will burn the entire sacrifice on the altar as a burnt offering. It is a special gift, a pleasing aroma to the Lord. It's just a burnt offering. That's all it is. It's just, it's an appreciation gift is really what it is. It is giving to God from what you have, really the best of what you have, a spotless animal, whether it's a bull or a sh- from a, a sheep or a goat. What's kind of cool about the burnt offering is that it, it also could, ap- it could apply to other animals. So nobody is excluded from this. We'll get into that a little bit later, but it's bringing to the Lord and saying, here's the best I have, a spotless offering just for you, just for you, God, just so for that, so you catch that aroma of that burnt offering. As it arises up into the heavens. And God loves barbecue. Uh, he loves barbecue. Okay, he loves the smell. Everybody loves the smell of barbecue. Um, and that's why I think, you know, Texas is as close as you're going to get to heaven on earth, I believe. Um, because this is God's country, right? We hear that all the time. Uh, no, I, listen. He, he, he loves this, this offering of just, it's just this thing of like, man, Lord, here's, here's this burnt offering from this animal that is like a substitutionary for me. And that's why this first one, it, it's an optional one, really. I mean, you don't have to do this, but when God is so good to you, why would you withhold this from him? You know? Verse 10, he says, if the animal you present as a burnt offering is from the flock, it may be either a sheep or a goat. It must be a male with no defects. Slaughter the animal on the north side of the altar in the Lord's presence, and Aaron's sons, the priests, will splatter its blood against all sides of the altar. You're like, this is very bloody. I get it, right? But, but again, praise God for the blood of Jesus, okay? So you, they throw the blood against all sides of the altar, then cut the animal in pieces, just like the bull. The priest will arrange the pieces uh, of the offering, including the head and the fat, wood, the wood burning on the altar, but the internal organs and legs must first be washed with water. Water. Then the priest will burn the entire sacrifice on the altar as a burnt offering. It is a special gift, a pleasing aroma to the Lord. So on the same level. Now, just so you understand, a, a, a bull is worth so much more money than a sheep or a goat. So, and it, but it lists that as first. is like, if, if you want to offer to the Lord greatly, go for it. But if, let's say you can't afford to give a, a bull, well, then give a sheep or a goat. And there's even a, you know, uh, the last little section there, there's, a, there's an allowance there for like, let's say you can't afford to give a sheep or a goat. You're like, all I got is birds, right? And God's like, I'll take your bird, <laughs> right? He's like, I love that too. And that's verse 14. If you present a bird as a burnt offering to the Lord, choose either a turtle dove or a young pigeon. 
the priest will take the bird on to the altar. Here's your fun part. <laughs> Ring off its head. Uh, everybody's like, ah. Um, and burn it on the altar. Um, sorry, but it's, listen, it's going to get a lot more descriptive through Leviticus, okay? So just hold on tight, right? Poor bird. I get it, but hey, um, it's a gift to God. There you go. But first he must drain its blood against the side of the altar. The priest must also remove the crop uh, and the feathers and throw them in the ashes on the east side of the altar. Then grasping the bird by its wings, the priest will tear the bird open, but without tearing it apart, then he will burn it as a burnt offering on the wood burning on the altar. It is a special gift, a pleasing aroma to the Lord. And that's chapter one. And you're like, oh, dear Lord, um, so much death. Uh, hey, okay, another thing you can add to your list of things you're thankful for. You're not a Levite back in the day, right? If you're like, all oh, this, well, praise God, you weren't having to, you know, spatchcock birds and all that good stuff, right? <laughs> like tearing these birds apart. Um, I wouldn't have made it. I just, I, I just wouldn't have probably made it. Um, but that's the burnt offering. It's a free will offering. It's a free will offering. It's like, man, Lord, I'm so thankful. I'm so grateful. And here's what I have. Here's what I have. Even if it's, even if it's just a bird, it's the best that I have to offer to you. And I just want to offer it to you. Chapter two, we look at the grain offering, another free will type offering. When you present, uh, when you present the grain as an offering to the Lord, the, the offering must, be, uh, must consist of choice flour. You are to pour olive oil on it, sprinkle it with frankincense, and bring it to Aaron's sons, the priest. The priest will scoop out a handful of the flour moistened with oil together with all the frankincense and burn this representative portion on the altar. It is a special gift, a pleasing aroma to the Lord. The rest of the grain offering will then be given to Aaron and his sons. This offering will be considered a most holy part of the special gifts presented to the Lord. So he's like, get your flour, get your oil, mix in some frankincense there, because when it burns, you're going to smell that. You're going to smell that, and that's going to that's gonna go up. Here's what's crazy is this, this is happening. That aroma makes its way up into the nostrils of God. That's amazing. That's incredible. Now, it's not like it has to go up through our atmosphere and through space and zip through some, like, you know, black hole or something like that. No, because God is everywhere. He's omnipresent. And so when these, uh, these offerings are being made, he's taking it in. He's taking it in. It's, it's amazing. So you got this grain offering, right? Um, this is going to be a way for, they, way for them to recognize and confess their dependence on God for their provisions, for their food, and for their, just their lives. This is a bloodless offering, right? So you get a little, a little relief for a second, right? The bloodless offering. Uh, we're also going to, we're going to mix in some salt here in a second, and that's for permanence. That's for like, uh, to show like it's, it's for everlasting. Um, verse four, if the offering is, uh, if, if your offering is a grain offering baked in an oven, right? Who doesn't love that? That's beautiful. Um, it must be made of choice flour, but without any yeast. Okay. We remember that from the Exodus. Okay. They were to bake their bread without any yeast. It may be presented in the form of thin cakes mixed with olive oil or wafers spread with olive oil. If your grain offering is cooked on a griddle, it must be made of choice flour mixed with olive oil, uh, but without any yeast. Break it in pieces, pour olive oil on it. It is a grain offering. If your grain offering is prepared in a pan, it must be made of choice flour and olive oil, right? This is like biscuits or something, right? It's just like, uh, I'm like salivating because I'm thinking of like cornbread, biscuits, pancakes, you know, all that good stuff, right? I'm like, oh man, um, yeah, I can't wait to get to heaven. I don't know what the food is going to be like in heaven. I know there's a tree of life and you can eat freely from that. And I don't know what exactly that means. Um, and I don't know, but I tell you guys this all the time, but my, my little uh, Jewish Italian friend, Michael Schumann from uh, Long Island, New York, is convinced there's going to be donuts in heaven, and I'm right there with him. I'm like, yes, please. Donut. I like the donuts, but maybe some biscuits, biscuits and gravy in heaven. I'm all for it, right? Um, when I see this grain offering, I'm like, all right, I can get down with this. Yeah, a little grain offering to God. Um, 
And the priests get the, this is part of like that, the offering concerning the grain offering is like, this is their food, okay? Because they don't, they're not working. And so they're having food and, and the other part will be provided for them as well, the meat. But concerning the grain offering, verse eight, it says, no matter how a grain is offered to, for the Lord uh, has been prepared, bring it to the priest who will present it at the altar. The priest will take a, represent, a representative portion of the grain offering and burn it on the altar. It is a special gift, a pleasing aroma to the Lord. The rest of the grain offering will then be given to Aaron and his sons as their food. This offering will be considered a most holy part of the special gifts presented to the Lord. Now, again, remember, this is like, thank you, God, for provision. And this is an act of faith, I believe, even with the sacrificing of their animals, because they know I don't have what I have unless God has given it to me. And so I'm going to take a portion of what God has given to me, and I'm going to give it back as an offering to God, trusting that what he gave me at the beginning, he will continue to provide for me. That's faith. That's faith. And that's why, like, and it, it's faith. It's an act of worship. That's why uh, giving is an act of worship, because you are really trusting, like, uh, I don't have this unless God has given it to me, so I'm going to take a part of this, and I'm going to give it back to him as an offering, because I know he's going to provide it, because I know he's going to provide it. And that's and that's that's really how giving and tithing and all that stuff that's that's really that should be the heart behind it it shouldn't be like you know pass the plate and here's we got we we got to write use more funds for this and that look the church is always going to need funds i mean that's a reality of a church however it should never be about you know the thermometer on the stage and this and that it's it should be about i mean has he taken care of you okay cool well then just trust him to continue to take care of you and then you know, and then if if you're being ministered here or there's a ministry or missionaries that you want to support, give freely to them. Trusting and knowing like, man, God's going to take care of me. He'll take care of me. Um, so that's what's kind of cool about these offerings as well. And with the grain and the just trusting in the Lord for provision, I mean, he's always going to come through. He's always going to come through. And again, with this grain offering, I'm just reminded you know, daily bread. That was part of Jesus' model prayer to his disciples. Give us this day our daily bread. Why? Because I'm going to cut off a portion of that. I'm going to give it back to God. I'm going to give it back to him. Why? Because he's going to give me daily bread. He's got me. Verse 11, do, do not use yeast in the pre preparing of any of the grain offerings you present to the Lord because no yeast or honey, oh, that's a bummer to me, may be burned as a special gift presented to the Lord. I love honey too much. I love it too much. Uh, but it's the best thing ever from little bugs that can pro possibly kill me, okay? I don't know. I've got an allergy or something, but praise God for honey. Um, so you can't burn it up. That's fine. Verse 12, you may add yeast and honey to an offering of the first crops of your harvest, but these must never be offered on the altar as a pleasing aroma to the Lord. Season all your grain offerings with salt to remind you of God's eternal covenant right that's why it's that it's that permanence it's that long lasting it's a preserver that's what salt is and the jews back then believed that even salt couldn't be destroyed by fire okay and so he's saying season it with salt don't worry about your blood pressure because it's not for you it's for me it's a it's a burnt offering to god okay so he's like season that thing with salt but it represents his eternal covenant Never forget to add salt to your grain offerings. Verse 14, if you present a grain offering to the Lord from the first portion of your harvest, bring fresh grain that is coarsely ground and roasted on a fire. Put olive oil on this grain offering and sprinkle it with frankincense. The priest will take a representative portion of the grain moistened with oil together with all the frankincense and burn it as a special gift presented to the Lord, right? So we get it. You got some grain offerings? You want to make a, an a voluntary grain offering cool well here's the parameters you can't just show up and throw some some pancakes on the on the altar right you're like i made these and you're like no there's yeast in there or like yeah I, I didn't have time so here you go god like that doesn't fly that doesn't fly there's rules there's rules why i don't like rules he didn't ask you if you like rules he says this is how you'll worship me 
but all the other nations are doing it this way. And he's like, I don't care about all the other nations. When it comes to worshiping me, you will worship like this. But in Egypt, we used to, no, this is different. This is different. For you and I, serving God, worshiping God, this is different. This is different. This is holy. Chapter three, if you present, this is a peace offering, um, peace or fellowship offering as you can uh, I think you can call it either one of those. If you present an animal from the herd as a peace offering to the Lord, it may be a male or a female, but it must have no defects. Okay, so first burnt offering, male, animal only. This one, peace offering, is male or a female, still no defects though. Okay, lay your hand on the animal's head and slaughter it at the entrance of the tabernacle. Then Aaron's sons, the priests, will splatter the blood against all the sides of the altar. The priest must present part of this peace offering as a special gift to the Lord. This includes all the fat around the internal organs and the two kidneys and the fat around them near the loins and along the lobe of the liver. There must be, uh, these must be removed with the kidneys and Aaron's sons will burn them on top of the burnt offering on the wood burning on the altar. It is a special gift, a pleasing aroma to the Lord. Now, here's where naturally I'd want to slow down and be like, okay, let's talk about these organs that filter out all the impurities within our bodies, okay? Because that's technically what they do. And why he has those set aside for this peace offering, um, there's so much behind this, so much behind this. And one day we will revisit this, okay? We will revisit this. But there's a distinction between the burnt offering and the peace offering. There's similarities, but there's also some differences there. And some of these organs being thrown on top of the pile and the fact that it could be a male or a female animal, um, there, there's definitely distinctions that are there, okay? And they're not just like, you read through that like, oh, that's different, and they're there for a reason. However, we don't have the time to get into a lot of that, but I do find it fascinating that a lot of those organs are what are used within our bodies to filter out bad stuff within us, okay? So you got this peace offering, um, and again, this is going to be more blood. Here you go. Um, verse 6, if you present an animal from the flock as a peace offering to the Lord, it may be male or female, but it must have no defects. If you present a sheep as your offering, bring it to the Lord, lay your hand on its head, slaughter it in front of the tabernacle. Aaron's sons will splatter the blood, the sheep's blood, against all sides of the altar. The priest must present the fat of this peace offering as a special gift to the Lord. This includes the fat of the uh, broad tail cut off near the backbone, all the fat around the internal organs, the two kidneys, and the fat around them near the loin, and the long lobe uh, of the liver. These must be removed with the kidneys, and the priest will burn them on the altar as it is a special gift of food presented to the Lord. If you present a goat as your offering, bring it to the Lord, lay your hand on its head, Slaughtered in front of the tabernacle, Aaron's sons will then splatter the goat's blood against all sides of the altar. The priest must present part of this offering as a special gift to the Lord. This includes all the fat around the internal organs, two kidneys, and the fat around them near the loins, the long lobe of the liver. These must be removed with the kidneys, and the priest will burn them on the altar. It is a special gift of food, a pleasing aroma to the Lord. All the fat belongs to the Lord. Here's a caveat. You must never eat any fat or blood. This is a permanent law for you, and it must be observed from generation to generation wherever you live, right? And you're like, well, that, if that's different, right? Don't eat the fat. Don't, not the blood. Why to abstain from the blood? There could be a chance that that's a reference back to Genesis chapter 9, verse 4, when God told Noah, don't drink the blood or don't eat the blood from any animals because within that blood, it's, it's, that, it's the life of the animal. So he's saying, stay away from the blood, okay? Now, if you're feeling guilty because you like your steaks, a little bit rare. And you're like, oh no, I'm a sinner, right? I need to make a sacrifice now. You don't, okay, it's fine. Eat your rare steaks, that's fine. Um, but he's talking about out of like, really, again, it's a distinction between cultures that were surrounding them and what was normal around some of these other cultures. <clears throat> Even to this day, we have, you can go to certain places on this globe and they are drinking blood from animals, 
which is not a good idea. I don't think. Of course, I'm not a doctor or a dietitian, um, but I, you will never find me um, drinking from, you know, blood from an animal. I'm just not going to do it, okay? Because it just seems like a bad idea, right? And God is telling his people, you will be distinct. You're going to be different. And you're also going to, as, as weird as it may seem, respect these animals that are being offered up to God, okay? You're like, but they're losing their lives. <laughs> um, yeah, I get that. I get that. But there should be a certain amount of respect for the animal itself as a creation from God being used as an offering to him, okay? So verse, or no, not verse, chapter, chapter four. Look, see, they just fly by. See, you're thinking like, he's not gonna do this. There's no way. Chapter four, here we go. Then the Lord said to Moses, give the following instructions to the people of Israel. This is how you are to deal with those who sin unintentionally. Uh Uh-oh, this is a sin offering, okay? Unintentionally, by doing anything that violates one of the Lord's commands. If the high priest sins, uh uh-oh, that's the main guy, right? Yeah, they sin too, okay? (laughs) They have to make sacrifices as well except not that greatest high priest named Jesus, he never had to do this, although he sacrificed, offered himself, right? But he was sinless. If the high priest sins, bringing guilt upon the entire community, he must give a sin offering for the sin he has committed. He must present to the Lord a young bull with no defects. He must bring the bull to the Lord at the entrance of the tabernacle, lay his hand on the bull's head, Slaughter it before the Lord. The high priest will then take some of the bull's blood into the tabernacle, dip his finger in the blood, sprinkle it seven times before the Lord in front of the inner curtain of the sanctuary. The priest will then put some of the blood on the horns of the altar for fragrant incense that stands in the Lord's presence inside the tabernacle. He will pour out the rest of the bull's blood at the base of the altar for burnt offerings at the entrance of the tabernacle. Then the priest must remove all the fat from the bull to be offered as a sin offering. This includes all the fat around the internal internal organs, the two kidneys, the fat around them near the loins, the long lobe of the liver. He must remove these along with the kidneys just as he does with with cattle offered as peace offerings. And burn them on the altar of burnt offerings. He must take whatever is left of the bull, its hide, meat, head, legs, internal organs, and dung, and carry it away to a place outside the camp that is ceremonial, ceremonially clean, ceremonially clean, as I'm having a hard time saying that word, the place where the ashes are dumped. There on the ash heap, he will burn it on a wood fire. That's your high priest. He's like, I should probably make sure I offer a sacrifice for myself. Why? Because if he doesn't, then he brings this like calamity onto the entire group, to an entire group. So if you have a, let's say you have a pastor who feels he has, he has no need to repent ever, you might want to steer clear, okay? <laughs> you might want to steer clear because every pastor, senior pastor, and fill in whatever blank you want to add before that. Every pastor has to own sin in their lives. They have to. They have to. That's a part of it. Now, again, praise God we're not slaughtering animals, but the principle still remains. The principle still remains. And if I am ever unwilling to go to God because I get this arrogant notion that, well, I'm no longer a sinner, run away. Flee, flee, go find somewhere else that's healthier, okay? Because pastors who think like that, that's, that's sinful. That in and of itself is sinful thinking, okay? The high priest had an obligation to present themselves before the Lord and have their sins atoned for before they ever represented the people. And that was serious. So you start there. There's going to be some other groups that are mentioned, but we start there. We start with concerning the the Levites and all that. We start with the high priest. Got to start there. The second group that's mentioned is the entire community of Israel. Um, And just a side note on the sin offering. 
It provides forgiveness and atonement or covering uh, for sins committed unintentionally against God's commands, right? These are ones that you're like, oh, I didn't know that was a sin. Oh, I just found out that was a sin. Well, okay, um, we'll just own it and then don't do it anymore, right? Um, and that's, that's the beautiful thing about even, even today, nowadays, where it's like some people may be doing things, and if you've ever ministered to people, you probably have come across this where you say like, hey, you know, you shouldn't do that. And they're like, well, why? Well, because the Bible says that's a sin. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, okay. And then hopefully they take that and be like, and if they're a Christian, they're like, okay, well then I'm gonna stop doing that because the Bible says to stop doing that. That's ultimately what we want. And so praise God, there's, there's, an, there's you know, covering for even unintentional sins. Maybe you're doing something you're like, I didn't even know that was wrong. That's okay. Now you do. Now we deal with it and now we move on, right? The entire community of Israel, it says uh, if, if the entire community, entire Israelite community sins by violating one of God's commands, but the people don't realize it, they're still guilty. See, that's the thing. That's the part we want to leave off in modern Christianity, right? You're doing something you don't realize is wrong. Um, well, we just will ignore it because we don't like confrontation and we don't like to tell people that, hey, that's a sin. You shouldn't do that. When the Bible says, well, no, even if you're doing it and you don't realize it's a sin, you're still guilty of sinning. God looks down at you and is like, you still did it. <laughs> you still did it. Now, my son died for that, but you were still doing it. So there has to be an owning of the sin, right? He says they're still guilty, verse 14, when they become aware of their sin, the people must bring a young bull as an offering for their sin and present it before the tabernacle. The elders of the community, okay, so here's their leadership within the community there, must lay their hands on the bull's head and slaughter it before the Lord. Now, this is a representation of the whole community, the elders. So the high priest has done his thing. Now the elders who help to rule, they put their hands collectively on these animals, probably plural because it may be more, or maybe it's just the one representing the whole community, whatever that looks like. They, as the leaders, put their hands on that saying, okay, we are identifying this as a covering for the entire community. Okay, really kind of a cool, really beautiful picture there of like a nation and a community coming together and saying like, let's do this all together. Let's just do this together. So they put their hands on his head, slaughter it before the Lord. The high priest will then take some of the bull's blood into the tabernacle, dip his finger in the blood, sprinkle it seven times before the Lord in front of the inner curtain. He will then put some of the blood on the horns of the altar for fragrant incense that stands before the Lord's presence inside the tabernacle. He will pour out the rest of the blood at the base of the altar for burnt offerings at the entrance of the tabernacle. Then the priest must remove all the animal's fat, burn it on the altar, just as he does with the bull offered as a sin offering for the high priest. Through this process, the priest will purify the people, making them right with the Lord, and they will be forgiven. Then the priest must take what is left of the bull and carry it outside the camp, burn it there, just as it is done with the sin offering for the high priest. This offering is for the sin of the entire congregation of Israel. So it's cool. Let's high priest is covered. Hey, let's make sure the congregation is covered in case there's an unintentional sin happening out there. Right? Really kind of cool. Like, I mean, this, this should like just foster community and, and togetherness within the nation of Israel. We are all in this thing together. We are distinct. We are separate from all these other nations because no other nations are really doing these types of things. Then we go on to uh, the next little group here. If one of Israel's leaders sins by violating one of the commands, so you have your high priest, you have the community, now you have the leaders within the community violating one of the commands of the Lord, his God, but doesn't realize it, he is still guilty. When he becomes aware of his sin, he must bring as his offering a male goat with no defects. So now you got not a, not a bull, but you have a goat for the, for the leader. No defects, right? So he can't even, he can't just bring his broke down goat, right? You know, it's like, oh, you know, I, 
I think I messed up, and uh, let me find that three-legged goat over there and offer that to the Lord. And the Lord's like, I don't want that. Um, you're not, I want your best. And so he, he has to bring his best, and he slaughters it at the place of the burnt offerings where they're slaughtered before the Lord. This is an offering for his sins. Then the priest will dip his finger in the blood of the sin offering and put it on the horns of the altar for the burnt offerings. He will pour out the rest of the blood at the base of the altar. So notice there is no sprinkling of the blood against the sides of the altar with the goat. Then he must burn all the goats fat on the altar just as he does with the peace offering. Through this process, the priest will purify the leader from his sin, making him right with the Lord, and he will be forgiven. Verse 27. Now to the commoners. Just, and this isn't like you're not as valuable as a leader or the high priest. or No, it's just saying just everybody. I mean, you have your community that's represented by the one sacrifice. So you have the high priest community as a whole, leaders, but then also just the individuals within the community. That's kind of what this is talking about, the common people. If any common people sin by violating one of God's commands, but they don't realize it, they're still guilty. When they become aware of their sin, they must bring as an offering for their sin a female goat, okay? A female goat with no defects. They must lay a hand on the head of the sin offering and slaughter it at the place where the burnt offerings are slaughtered. Then the priest will dip his finger in the blood, put it on the horns of the altar for the burnt offerings. He will pour out the rest of the blood at the base of the altar. Then he must remove all the goat's fat, just as he does with the fat of the peace offering. He will burn the fat on the altar, and it will be a pleasing aroma to the Lord. Through this process, the priest will purify the people, making them right with the Lord, and they will be forgiven. Okay, now uh, hopefully you're catching on to some of this stuff, and you should maybe make a little note or a highlight or a star by that repeated phrase, will be forgiven, and you will be forgiven, because this plays into our New Testament times, so to speak, where Jesus, as the perfect sacrifice— took all of our sins upon himself, died on the cross, sp spilled his blood for us so that you will be forgiven, okay? So whatever it is, if you present it to the Lord, you will be forgiven. Like, that's it. As matter of fact as it was for these guys, Back in the day, there at Mount Sinai, and Moses is throwing down all the, you know, here's how we're going to offer offerings to God. But here's what this means for you. It means you will be forgiven for you and I to walk in this forgiveness with Jesus, confessing our sins. If you got something, or maybe he makes you aware of something within your life that needs to be confessed, you confess it, and you will be forgiven. And that's it. There's a period after that statement. There's no room for the enemy to come in and say, well, but really? But really? So if you were forgiven of that, then why'd you do it again? Well, because I'm a little hard-headed, I guess, right? I guarantee you all these people, none of these people made one sacrifice for once in their life. This was a repeat thing. You probably had, if you had some honest people within the group, they're probably showing up multiple times. They're like, yeah, I know I was here this morning, but then when I left, I got in a traffic jam, and uh, so I had to grab another goat and come back. And I hope that the traffic has lessened up so that when I go home, I don't have to turn around and come back for the evening sacrifice, right? <laughs> like, that's, that would have been me, right? I would have been getting in all my steps, right? Like, from home to, like, I gotta go back, I gotta go back. We're running out of animals. I know, I know. Um, and it's only Tuesday, right? And you're like, slow down. Praise God that in Christ, you will be forgiven. Yeah, but you don't know. You will be forgiven. You will be. It's a done deal. And that's your sin offering. Um, the young unblemished bull, just as a side note to that, is the costliest animal for an Israelite. It's the costliest animal. Again, I already mentioned that, but just want to make sure that you understand that. Concerning a, an unintentional sin, God's like, okay, there will be forgiveness for you, but a sacrifice has to be made. Sacrifice has to be made. 
Now, chapter 5 takes a, a little bit of a turn, and then in the middle of chapter 5, we will get our, our guilt offering, okay? But look at chapter 5, verse 1. If you are called to testify about something you have seen or that you know about, it is sinful to refuse to testify, and you will be punished for your sins, all right? So now he takes a little turn, and he says, let's talk about community life in Israel, and let's talk about justice and consequences, something our world knows nothing of. And it's, yeah, I, I, I'm surprised at our leaders, especially within Houston. Uh, and they're so, like, cl- they're, they have no idea of, like, how is, a sin, how is a crime so bad? I'm like, well, you keep letting the criminals out, then the crime's going to be bad. Now, I don't have my degree in law enforcement or anything like that, but I think it's a common sense thing. And I think when you move away from consequences, then you're going to have more crime. <laughs> I think that's how that works. And I think the Bible is very clear on there, have to, there has to be consequences. There has to be consequences. So let's look at this. He says, if you're called to testify about something you've seen, you've witnessed a crime happen, and you refuse, you're in trouble. <laughs> you're in trouble. That's a sin. It, it's sinful to refuse to testify. Man, this kid... This needs to be applied in our society today. How many people are hiding out in their homes and they don't want to testify about a crime that they know about or that they've seen? Why, I get it. There's a fear of retaliation. I understand that. But my goodness, that's an injustice. That's an injustice. And and this was an issue back then. And Moses, obviously from directed direction from the Lord, is saying, oh, by the way, if you see something that happens that's wrong, you need to speak up. You need to speak up. It's sinful to refuse to testify. You're going to be punished for that. You're going to be punished for that. Crazy. Verse 2. Or suppose you unknowingly touch something that is ceremonially unclean, such as a carcass of an unclean animal, right? You just happen to like, maybe you trip and you fall and you're like, what did I trip over? Oh no, it was an unclean animal, okay? Now I'm unclean. What do I do? It says, when you realize what you've done, you must admit your defilement and your guilt. You're like, I didn't mean to. It's okay. It's not as bad as it sounds, all right? So this is true, whether it is a wild animal, a domestic animal, or an animal that scurries along the ground, right? It's just, if it happens and you aware, become aware of it, just own it. Just own it. Make it right. That's what I always say. Make it right. Just make it right. Or suppose, verse 3, you unknowingly touch something that makes a person unclean. When you realize what you've done, you must admit your guilt. Oh, I touched that. Shouldn't have touched that. Lord, I'm sorry. I just touched that dead animal, and I didn't really mean to. My apologies, right? Like, I, I, you just own it. That's all it is. It's very simple. Or suppose, verse 4, you make a foolish vow of any kind, whether it's uh, purposes for good or bad. When you realize it's foolishness, you must admit your guilt, right? So don't be too quick to speak. Don't be too quick to speak, right? Somebody's talking to you and they're like, hey, you know, what about this? And oh yeah, I could do that. I could do that. I'm gonna do that for you. Woo, and then you walk away and you're like, I can't do that. Uh, And then the Lord's like, well, okay, admit it and own it, right? And also probably tell them that you made a foolish vow, okay? You're like, hey, about the thing I told you I could do? I can't do that. I can't do it, right? Verse 5, when you become aware of your guilt in any of these ways, you must confess your sin. Then you must bring to the Lord as a penalty for your sin a female from the flock, either a sheep or a goat. This is a sin offering with which the priest will purify you from your sin, making you right with the Lord. But if you cannot afford to bring a sheep, you may bring to the Lord two turtle doves or two young pigeons as the penalty for your sin. One of the birds will be for a sin offering, the other for a burnt offering. You must bring them to the priest who will present the first bird as a sin offering. He will wring its neck, with, but without severing the head from the body. Oh, praise God for that. Um, then he will sprinkle some of the blood of the sin offering against the sides of the altar, and the rest of the blood will be drained out at the base of the altar. This is an offering for sin. The priest will then prepare the second bird as a burnt offering who is now stressing out because he saw what happened to his buddy. He's like, oh, great, I'm next, right? Yeah. Um, Following all the procedures that have been prescribed, 
Through this process, the priest will purify you from your sin, making you right with the Lord, and you will be forgiven. But if you can't afford two turtle doves or two young pigeons or to bring them, you may bring two quarts of choice flour for your sin offering. Since it is an offering for sin, you must not moisten it with olive oil or put any frankincense on it. Take the flour to the priest who will scoop out a handful as a representative portion. He will burn it on the altar on top of the special gifts presented to the Lord. It is an offering for sin. Through this process, the priests will purify those who are guilty of any of these sins, making them right with the Lord, and they will be forgiven. The rest of the flour will belong to the priest, just as, it, just as with the grain offering. And you may be thinking like, what is the big deal? What's the big deal? So I told a little lie. What's the big deal? And God says, no, I define what's a big deal. No, I define that. I know your culture would have you to think this, but I define worship. I define what it means to be my follower. God sets the, par the parameters and the boundaries. God tells us what, what is worship and what is not worship. It is a big deal because it's a hard issue. Ultimately, it's a hard issue. And that's what the Lord, I think he's using some of these like small examples to highlight the fact that in here, in our hearts, man, we're just sinful people. We're just sinful people. And it's a miracle there's any animals left on this planet, right? <laughs> I mean, my goodness, if there, was no, if there was no once and for all sacrifice, if we were really honest, uh, every animal would be on the endangered species list, right? Because it's like, oh gosh, I, the more, man, the Lord, the more the Lord reveals to me how my heart truly is, I'm like, it's just desperately wicked. It's desperately wicked. Here's the guilt offering, and then we'll wrap this all up here. Then the Lord said to Moses, if one of you commits a sin by unintentionally defiling the Lord's sacred property, you must bring a guilt offering to the Lord. The offering must be your own ram with no defects. So this is, a, again, a different, different kind of animal here. Or you may buy one of equal value with silver as measured by the weight of the sanctuary shekel. Okay, so this is where we get some of that temple stuff we were going through in, in uh, the Gospel of Mark. Okay. So, but you got to provide this, this animal. If you don't have that animal, well, then you, can, you should be able to buy one at the sanctuary. Okay, you should be able to get one there. You must make restitution for the sacred property you have harmed by paying for the loss, plus an additional 20%. Well, that's it. You want to keep people from making mistakes and all that stuff? Yeah, tack on 20%. Like, hey, you stole that person's car? Guess what? You give them back their car, and then you're going to pay them 20% of what that thing's worth. You stole their money, you give them back their money, and then you're going to give them 20% extra. I think you'd see crime rates drop significantly. If people are actually held accountable, we don't even hold them accountable for the wrongs that they do. Slap them on the wrist, go spend some time in jail. We won't hold you there. Well, we will if we can make money off of you in prison because we do that too. We're so messed up here. There are no consequences, but here God's like, oh no, there's going to be consequences there's going to be consequences. Like not just you're repaying what you, what you messed up. Oh, you're paying extra. You're going to pay extra, right? That's a good deterrent for, for crime. So there's that 20%. When you give the payment to the priest, he will purify you with the ram sacrifice as a guilt offering, making you right with the Lord, and you will be forgiven. Suppose you sin by violating one of the Lord's commands. Even if you are unaware of what you've done, you are guilty and will be punished for your sin. For, an offer, for a guilt offering, you must bring to the priest your own ram with no defects, or you may buy one of equal value. Through this process, the priest will purify you from your unintentional sin, making you right with the Lord, and he will forgive you, or and you will be forgiven. This is the guilt offering, for you've been guilty of an offense against the Lord, right? So similar to the sin offering, uh, but there's a you know, the concept of restitution is included within this offering, okay? Now, chapter six, chapter six, six and seven actually go real quickly because it, it kind of gives you like further instructions concerning what we just went over. So this is the beauty of it, right? Um, 
Chapter 6, verse 1, then the Lord said to Moses, suppose one of you sins against your associates and is unfaithful to the Lord. Suppose you cheat in a deal involving a security deposit, or you steal or commit fraud, or you find lost property, this is concerning the guilt offering, uh, and lie about it, or you lie while swearing to tell the truth, or you commit any other such sin. If you have sinned in any of these ways, you are guilty guilty but but no but your honor not guilty guilty okay no excuses it's guilt you must give back whatever you stole or the money you took by extortion or the security deposit or the lost property you found or anything obtained by swearing falsely you must make restitution by paying the full price plus an additional 20 percent to the person you have harmed man can we, can we implement this in our world today? My goodness. On the same day, you must present a guilt offering. As a guilt offering to the Lord, you must bring to the priest one of your own ram, or your own ram with no defects, or you may buy one of equal value, and you can't buy it with the money you stole, and nor can you offer the, the ram that you stole from that person, or you swindled out of them. It's got to be your own. It has to be your own. It says you can buy one of equal value. Through this process, the priest will purify you before the Lord, making you right with him, and you will be forgiven for any of these sins you have committed, right? So don't commit these sins. However, if you, if you do, there is forgiveness for those sins. But there's also a price to pay when you intentionally sin against somebody else. Concerning the burnt offering, verse 8, Then the Lord said to Moses, Give Aaron and his sons the following instructions regarding the burnt offering. The burnt offering must be left on top of the altar until the next morning, and the fire on the altar must be kept burning all night. In the morning, after the priest on duty has put on, um, has put on his official linen clothing and linen, linen undergarments, he must clean out the ashes of the burnt offerings and put them beside the altar. Then he must take off these garments, change back into his regular clothes, and carry the ashes out. recording the great we'll find this and be like oh the battery died that's what happened um anyways uh hey we're back um let's start back in chapter one just kidding um <laughs> you're like no please no please please no all right so you got the burnt offering everything must be uh kept there you got to scoop out the ashes change your clothes to go throw the ashes out onto you know outside the city kind of a deal verse um uh, the rest of verse 11 there, and carry the ashes outside the camp to the place that is ceremonially clean. Verse 12, meanwhile, the fire on the altar must be kept burning and it must never go out. Each morning, the priest will add fresh wood to the fire and arrange the burnt offering on it. He will then burn the fat of the peace offerings on it. Remember, the fire must be kept burning on the altar at all times. It must never go out. That's a little place where you put a side note of like, Lord, keep the fire burning in my heart at all times. May it never go out. The grain offering. Verse 14, these are the instructions regarding, regarding the grain offering. Aaron's sons must present this offering to the Lord in front of the altar. The priest on duty will take the grain offering, offering a handful of choice flour moistened with olive oil together with all the frankincense. He will burn this representative portion on the altar as a pleasing aroma to the Lord. Aaron and his sons may eat the rest of the flour, but it must be baked without yeast eaten in a sacred place within the courtyard of the temple or the tabernacle. Remember, it must never be prepared with yeast. Yeast is always symbolic uh, of sin, okay? I have given it to the priests as their share of the special gifts presented to me. Like the sin offering the, and the guilt offering, it is most holy. Any of Aaron's male descendants may eat from the special gifts presented to the Lord. This is their permanent right from generation to generation. Anyone or anything that touches these offerings will become holy, set apart. Now, here's the, um, no, we'll break down the next, uh, the next one, okay? Verse 19, 
Then the Lord said to Moses, on the day Aaron and his sons are anointed, so this is ordination, they must present to the Lord a standard grain offering of two quarts of the choice flour, half of the, uh, have to be offered in the morning and half to be offered in the evening. It must be carefully mixed with olive oil, olive oil and cooked on a griddle. Then slice this grain offering and present it as a pleasing aroma to the Lord. In each generation, the high priest who succeeds Aaron must prepare this offering, uh, this same offering. It belongs to the Lord and must be burned up completely. This is a permanent law. All such grain offerings of a priest must be burned up entirely. None of it may be eaten. Last little bit, 24 through 30, as I realize... I'm not going to make it through seven. Oh, man, I lied. Um, oh, don't worry. I'll make an offering for that. Uh, <laughs> just kidding. Uh, it says, then the Lord said to Moses, give Aaron and his sons the following instructions regarding the sin offering. The animal given as an offering for, the, uh, for sin is the most holy off- offering. It must be slaughtered in the Lord's presence at the place where the burnt offering is uh, or, or slaughtered. The priest who offers um, the sacrifice as a sin offering must eat his portion in a sacred place within the courtyard of the tabernacle. Anyone or anything that touches the sacrificial meat will become holy. If any of the sacrificial blood splatters on a person's clothing, the soiled garment must be washed in a sacrificial or a sacred place. If a clay pot is used to boil the sacrificial meat, it must then be broken. If the bronze pot or a bronze pot is used, it must be scoured and thoroughly rinsed with water. Any male from a priest's family may eat of this offering. It is most holy. But the offering for sin may not be eaten if its blood was brought into the tabernacle as an offering for purification in the holy place. That goes back into the book of Exodus when there was uh, purification within the tabernacle itself. It says it must be completely burned with fire and so let me just land the plane there um you got seven i could run through that real fast but i'm not going to i could save it for next week um because it's just it's it's the guilt offering and it's more details concerning the guilt offering and a lot of this stuff is just like it's not redundant it's just repetitive okay redundant is like i get it i get it repetitive is like i should probably pay attention to this especially if you're a priest back in the day and this was your your duty you had to do this, right? Moses was like, you better pay attention, right? Because you guys, uh, what you didn't realize as a priest is you're kind of butchers. And uh, there's a lot of rules and regulations that have to happen here. The main thing I think we can take away from this is, is that God is holy and he is absolutely deserving of our very best. And who we are is sinful people. And Again, I, I know I reference this uh, a lot throughout these chapters, reading through them. Um, praise the Lord for Jesus and making one sacrifice, one sacrifice for all of our sins. Again, if you don't, it, you can't read through Leviticus and not just appreciate Jesus that much more, okay? <laughs> when you go through the Gospels and you're like, that one sacrifice, that perfect propitiation that you know substitute sacrifice for us man thank you jesus thank you thank you that your one sacrifice for all time covers all of our sins and there is forgiveness for those who have sinned that's the beauty of it and the last thing is this guys god never withheld his best from us he never withheld his best from us he, he gave us his absolute best in, in Jesus. When, when God offered up Jesus, he broke out his finest china for the worst people possible. For a bunch of kids who are going to do nothing but chip and break and scratch and defile and all that good stuff. He never stopped. He never withheld his best from us. He never withheld his best from us. And so I think as we go through Leviticus, I, I think it would, be, it would be good for us to not withhold our best from him. So let's get back to that. And, and I'm not talking about rigid Christianity and, and sterile and cold and all that kind of stuff. I'm talking about warm, just a, a warm, real reverence for who God is. And just, man, I want to give you my best. 
I want to give you my best because you deserve my best. So that's going to be our goal in going through the book of Leviticus. I will make a note that uh, I did not cover chapter 7. So next week, 7, 8, and 9, maybe. We'll see. I don't know. Um, who knows? But we will cover through, we will cruise through Leviticus at a rapid pace. But I, I think we'll, we'll, we'll glean from it what we need to. Okay? And so I'm going to pray, and we're going to close this thing out because I went for a long time.